Well, good morning, everyone. It is 10 o'clock sharp, and I want to welcome you again to another Tuesday morning ladies Bible study. Welcome to all of you who've joined us online. We're glad to have you with us. So let's just go ahead and pray this morning and get right in this thing. God, we thank you for your presence today. We thank you for your strength. Thank you for your healing, your power, your might, Lord. We just praise you for you. And Jesus, I ask for your anointing upon me today that I would have clarity of speech and mind. And that, Lord, our minds would be open to receive what you want to say to us today. Father, just come and be with us. We'll give you praise and honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Um, I do want to let you know, next week is the first Tuesday of October. It's hard to believe, but it is. And so we will be going out for lunch after the Bible study, and we'll be going to Mia's table. I'll send you uh, the address if you're not familiar with that. And maybe the weather will be nice. We can all eat out on the patio. if They have a really nice patio there. But uh, that will be Mia's table directly after the um, Bible study next week. So just keep that in mind and plan to go. It's a great time to get to know each other. We've got, um, you know, lots of catching up to do. And so it'll be a great time to do that. All righty. Well, last week we had some, we had an introduction to Mark, John Mark, who wrote the Gospel of Mark. And um, we started in Mark chapter 1, verse 1, where there is the announcement of the Gospel, the good news. And it is good news because it's about Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God. And we saw Mark back up the announcement of Jesus by referring to the Old Testament. He quotes Isaiah and Malachi. And both of the quotes that Mark uses here are talking about someone who's going to come and prepare the way of the Lord. We see it in verse 2. Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way before you. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. So the prophecy, and Mark is repeating it, there is a messenger, there's a voice, there is someone who's going to make preparation for the, for the Lord, for Jesus Christ, for Messiah when he comes. And then we see in verse 4 who that is. John came baptizing in the wilderness and preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of of sins. So John the Baptist is the voice that was prophesied from the Old Testament, repeated here in Mark. He is the voice of one crying in the wilderness. He was the messenger ordained by God to prepare the way for Jesus's earthly ministry. The Gospel of John talks about John the Baptist this way in John 1, 6. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness, to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. So John was the messenger. He was the voice crying in the wilderness. He was a witness. John the Baptist was the last of a powerful line of prophets to speak of the coming Messiah. And what was different with John's ministry is that he was actually able to see the Messiah. He could actually, he had the opportunity to actually touch the Messiah. Think about it. The other prophets, all in the Old Testament, could only speak and could only write about Jesus, but John was actually able to see him. So we're going to talk about John the Baptist today. Now let me just say this right up front. He is called John the Baptist because he baptized people in water. He is not the Baptist as in part of a denomination of a Baptist church that we know of today. But rather this description just indicated his ministry. He baptized people. So just want to make sure that we're all on the same page with that as we get started. In Matthew 11, we find Jesus talking about the ministry of John the Baptist. So we're going to read this, starting in verse 7. Jesus began to say to the multitudes concerning John, What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? But what did you go out to see? A man clothed in soft garments? 
Indeed, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I say to you, and more than a prophet. For this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. Assuredly, I say to you, among those born of women, there has not risen one greater than John the Baptist. But he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if you're willing to receive it, he is Elijah who is to come. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. All right, let's unpack this. Jesus calls John the greatest among women. We see that in verse 11. Now, that's a pretty significant description to give someone the greatest born among women, and it's coming from Jesus. So, we have to ask the question then, what was it about John the Baptist that made him so great? Was it that John was that prophetic voice that broke the 400 years of silence between the Old Testament and the New Testament? That's kind of important. Maybe it was John's birth. That was very unique. And in the Gospel of Luke, there's great detail given to the events leading up to his birth. You can read that entire story in Luke chapter 1. But it's a beautiful passage about two older people, way beyond years for having children. They loved God. They remained faithful to the Lord. And God honored them by allowing them to be mother and father to John the Baptist. I love how the angel told Zechariah, John's father, Luke 1, 14, and you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. Yes, John was, had this great assignment in the whole plan of salvation that was coming to the earth. Many would rejoice at his birth because of what this meant now. The fullness of time had come. But God, in his mercy, and to honor these parents, he makes it personal to Zechariah, and he says, you will have joy and gladness. Isn't that sweet? God had heard Zechariah and Elizabeth's prayers, and he's giving them joy and gladness. This was all part of John's unique birth. Maybe John's greatness came from living in the deserts of Israel. We don't know a lot about his childhood or those early years, except in Luke 1.80, we're told, So the child grew and became strong in spirit and was in the deserts till the day of his manifestation to Israel. Now, maybe John was the outdoorsy type, and then when his parents passed away because they were older, maybe at that time he made the wilderness his permanent home. John lived there in the wilderness, and it was a fulfillment of prophecy of of what the Old Testament had said, that he would be a voice crying in the wilderness. And the Bible tells us that he was living in the wilderness when the word of God came to him, that it was time now to begin his assignment. Now, I kind of doubt this, but maybe John's greatness came from how he looked and what he ate. (laughs) He certainly, I think, would be considered a trendsetter. I don't know about an influencer. Mark describes the way John looked. In Mark chapter 1, verse 6, it says, Now John was clothed with camel's hair and with a leather belt around his waist. He did not wear soft clothing. Jesus had said that in Matthew 11. And also we see here his diet. He ate locusts and wild honey. Now, just the fact that the Bible calls this out, I think this lets us know that even in Bible times when things were very different, this diet, what he ate, was still probably not common from the way most people lived or the way most people dressed. I don't know. Maybe John's greatness came from all of that. (laughs) Maybe his greatness came from him described as coming in the spirit of Elijah. 
The angel who had given his birth announcement said that John would go before Jesus in the spirit of Elijah. And in the passage we read earlier, Matthew 11, Jesus said that John was Elijah who is to come. So, and we know Elijah was a great Old Testament prophet, so maybe this was the reason for John's greatness. Now, some think the spirit of Elijah was demonstrated in, in the way John lived in the wilderness, the way he dressed, what he ate, because remember, Elijah himself often lived outdoors. He was by the brook Cherith and fed by the ravens. He stayed in caves. He lived on the land when Ahab and Jezebel were looking for him. So in some ways, John's outward appearance and his behavior was very similar to Elijah. But also the spirit of Elijah is seen in John by his boldness and his complete obedience to speak the message that God had called him to speak. Elijah was bold. He was bold to confront King Ahab. He was bold to kill the prophets of Baal. And even though John the Baptist had no political or religious position, he still came into Israel speaking with authority and boldness. So maybe his greatness came from walking in the spirit and power of Elijah. Maybe his greatness was because he was living out the Nazarite vow that the angel had told his father to teach him. Now, the Nazarite vow was a commitment made to the Lord, and we see that in Numbers chapter 6. You can go back and read that, all that was involved in that vow. But for the most part, someone would not drink any wine or strong drink. Sometimes they would not um, eat even grapes or raisins. They would not take anything from the vine, and they never cut their hair. It was an outward demonstration of a vow, a solemn commitment that they made as they were set apart unto God. So it wasn't just they were doing weird things. It was because they were being set apart unto the Lord. And it was an outward sign of that. And the angel told Zechariah, John was to be set apart for service unto the Lord. And he was to live out the Nazarite vow all of his life. Could it be that John was great because he stepped out into ministry during a time that was very chaotic? Luke chapter 3 verse 1 lists for us all the kings and the leaders who were in power during that specific time. There was Tiberius Caesar. He was one of Rome's most successful generals, but was more remembered for being a dark, reclusive ruler who really didn't want to be in that position. And one historian called him the gloomiest of men. (laughs) There was Pontius Pilate. He was the judge who gave the final approval for Jesus to be crucified. Herod the Tetrarch, which just means that he ruled over a portion of land. He was in Galilee. And this was the man who eventually would have John killed. He took his brother's wife and married her. Now that would not be a fun Thanksgiving. (laughs) He took part in the questioning of Jesus during Christ's trial. His brother Philip was also a tetrarch, and it was his wife who ran off to marry the brother Herod. Lysanias, another tetrarch, was thought to have given a lot of money and female slaves bribing the enemy just to keep his family on the throne. And then we have the two high priests, Annas and Caiaphas, related to one another. These were the ruling religious leaders, and they led the charge to have Jesus crucified. And even after Jesus had been crucified and was resurrected, they continued to persecute the early church, these religious leaders, telling the disciples, don't speak the name of Jesus. These were the people who were in charge. These were the people who were governing the land. When God spoke to John and said, it is time, it is time. And I find this so interesting because it's such a contrast that God would choose such a dark and unholy time and and place in history to send John out. 
But isn't that the hallmark of the gospel message? If there was no darkness, there would be no need for light. (laughs) And John came preparing the way of Jesus, the great light, in a very dark time and place. Oh, aren't you grateful that God's purposes and his plans, they just still march forward. No matter the circumstances, no matter who's ruling, no matter who's in the government, God said it was time and John went out no matter what. Maybe that's what made him great. Now you're going to have to choose one of these. Was John's greatness because he preached to everyone? We learn from his birth announcement in Luke chapter 1 verse 17 just some of the people that John will be speaking to. The angel tells Zechariah He will also, speaking of John, he will also go before him, speaking of Christ, in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Luke 3 tells us, verse 7, he preached to the multitudes who came to to hear him. So it was probably a mixture of Jew and Gentile. In verse 12 of Luke 3, he preached to tax collectors. In verse 14, he preached to the military, to the soldiers. These certainly would have been more Gentile. And he even preached to the wicked Herod Tetrarch because Herod had married his brother's wife. When Jesus was confronting the Pharisees about their lack of response to John's ministry in Matthew 21, 32, Jesus said, tax collectors and prostitutes believed John's message. So John preached to anyone, to everyone. He preached to the religious leaders, the chief priests and elders. Jesus said in that same verse, they didn't believe him, but they didn't stop John from continuing to preach to them. John was obedient to to God's call on his life, and he just kept preaching. He just kept preparing the way for Jesus. And he preached repentance. Maybe that's what it was that made him so great. He preached repentance. We saw it in Mark 1, 4, where Jesus preached a, or sorry, John preached a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Repent, repent. This should speak to us today. Regardless of who we are, and John's audience was very eclectic, no matter where we're from, what economic class we're in, the message is still the same. We must repent. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. We must repent. We must confess that we've broken God's laws and then invite his son to come in and be Lord of our lives. John preached repentance. He said in Luke 3.9, the ax is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. It was a strong message, but he was preparing the way for Jesus, preparing the way for Christ to bring in his kingdom to the hearts of these people. Repent, repent, get ready, he's coming. And with this message of repentance, John was also baptizing people. Now, maybe that's what made him great. Baptizing with full immersion underwater. Now, this was not something that was seen often in the Old Testament with the Jewish religion, but washing with water was very common. In the Mosaic laws, that was the laws that were handed down from God to his people through the hand of Moses, whenever the priests went to offer sacrifices, they would wash themselves at the, at the bronze laver that was at the tabernacle. When Aaron, the first high priest, and his sons were being prepared to step into their new roles, Moses washed them with water. When anyone was declared clean of a skin condition, they would need to wash themselves. We know that Laman the leper, king of Syria, you can read his story in 2 Kings chapter 5, he was told by the prophet Elisha, Go to the river Jordan and dip down seven times. Took some convincing, but eventually he did it and he came up clean, healed from the leprosy. So washing was certainly a way of 
physically being clean, but also being ceremonially clean before God. So for John to come baptizing in water with a message of repentance would not have been a foreign concept for the Jews. They understood the significance of washing in water in order to be clean. And this was a washing from head to toe. And this is something that we continue to practice today. Even though Jesus himself did not baptize, he told his disciples to baptize. In Matthew 28, we see verse 18. Jesus came and spoke to them, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. It's a physical outward sign to indicate that there's a work that's been done in us. Now let me just say this. If any of you struggle with marking the date that you were saved, maybe because you were raised in a Christian home and you always went to bed at night saying, Lord, forgive me, and you really can't find that specific date, if you've been baptized in water, you can mark that date as the day you repented and you asked Jesus into your heart because it's that public display of repenting, of inviting Christ as Lord of your life. It's a beautiful expression of worship. And John is doing this. As people repent, he baptizes them. He even baptized Jesus. Let's look at this in Mark's gospel. Mark chapter 1, verse 9. It came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And immediately, oh, there we go. Mark is using that word immediately. Remember I told you he loves that word. So we're going to see it a lot in this study. Immediately coming up from the water, he saw the heavens parting and the spirit descending upon him like a dove. Then a voice came from heaven. You are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. What a, what a sweet moment. John got to be there and, and do that. Now, let me ask the question. If Jesus never sinned, and we know that from 1 Peter 2, 22, he committed no sin, no deceit was found in his mouth. If he never sinned, why did he need to be baptized like all the other people? John was preaching a gospel of repentance, and Jesus had nothing to repent of. Have you ever thought about that? Well, I'm going to help you with some answers, if you did. First, as Jesus said in Matthew 3.15, John baptizing him was to fulfill all righteousness. It was to fulfill all righteousness. It was part of the plan. Jesus needed to identify with sinners. If he's going to be that sacrifice for sinners, he needed to identify with sinners. And he needed to be introduced to the crowd as the Messiah by John the messenger, by John the voice in the wilderness. So both of them were fulfilling their assignments and acknowledging each other's assignments. A great moment, a great moment. And there was also this transfer of the priesthood from the tribe of Levi, remember that's where the priest all came from, the tribe of Levi, that's what John was a part of, now to the tribe of Judah, where Jesus was from, because it had been prophesied that the, way back in Genesis that the Messiah would come from Judah. There was a lot happening there that day. The baptism of Jesus symbolized his death. That was to come. He's going down into the water. Like he went down into the grave. Then his powerful resurrection coming up. As conqueror over sin and death. And once Jesus was baptized. Immediately as John says. The Holy Spirit descended upon him. Oh it was a wonderful display of the Holy Trinity. And now Jesus is ready to begin his earthly ministry. What a moment And John the Baptist was the one who was there and baptized Jesus. How powerful is that? That has got to be what made him great. Another part of John's ministry that could have marked him as the greatest 
was the large number of crowds that came out to hear John and to respond to his message. Mark 1.5 says, Then all the land of Judea and those from Jerusalem went out to him and were all baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. All the land, all baptized. In fact, Jesus made reference in Matthew 11, that passage we read earlier, to the great intensity of, the great eagerness, almost violent way in which the people received John. Let's read that again it's from verse 12. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force. Pastor talked about this on Sunday. John's ministry was re received with great anticipation, great intensity, from the, by the multitudes. People were hungry for truth. And they were so excited. John was preaching it. And Jesus described their enthusiasm as violent. Now it was a good thing. Because they're getting prepared. To receive the kingdom of God when Jesus came. And this same excitement. This same violent reception of John. Would be transferred now to receiving Christ. Christ with that same great enthusiasm. As Pastor shared with us on Sunday, we should get violent with receiving the truth of Jesus. We should be violent in our prayers, seeking his presence, getting closer to him. Lord, whatever it takes, we want and we need more of you. And we're not gonna let go until we've received everything you have for us. Get violent. John's message stirred the hearts of the people with great intensity so they could be prepared for Jesus. So I've given you many things here that were great about John the Baptist. They're all very commendable attributes. But in answer to my question, did they make John great? I have to say no. As wonderful as they all were, they were not what made John great. What made John great, I think, can be found in his own words. He must increase and I must decrease. Let's read that whole passage. It's found in John chapter 3, starting in verse 27. John is talking Verse 27, John answered and said, A man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. John knew where his message came from. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. He knew his place in this whole plan of salvation. He who has the bride as is the bridegroom but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. And here it is. He must increase, but I must decrease. And he goes on and preaches a little bit here. He who comes from above is above all. Speaking of Christ, he who is of the earth is earthly and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. And what he has seen and heard that he testifies, and no one receives his testimony. He who has received his testimony has certified that God is true. For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for God does not give the Spirit by measure. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. John always knew he was not the Christ. He was not the Messiah. He knew he wasn't the light, the great light, but rather he just gave witness to the light. He was there. His purpose was to elevate Jesus, to exalt Jesus, to prepare the hearts of the people to receive Jesus when he came. 
He knew that he was nothing, but that Jesus was everything. He knew his ministry was limited. Look at this in Mark 1 verse 7. He says, there comes one after me who is mightier than I, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to stoop down and loose. John was a very humble man. I indeed baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. John could baptize in water to signify that a repentance had taken place. But John knew that the greater work was going to be done with Jesus when he changed that repentant heart by the power of the Holy Spirit and then baptized that person, filled them to to overflowing with the Spirit of Christ. Only Jesus, only Jesus the Messiah could do that. Not John, and John knew it. He knew that there would come a day that his ministry would fade away so that the ministry of Jesus could take center stage. John's assignment, and he knew it, was only to prepare the way of Christ and to stir the people's hearts so they could get ready to receive him. It's a, it's a beautiful mixture in John, this, this mixture of humility, but then boldness to fulfill his assignment, all in submission under Christ. John is bold, and he confronts King Herod. Because Herod stole his brother's wife. And understandably, it makes the wife angry. Let's read this in Mark 6, starting in verse 17. Herod himself had sent and laid hold of John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias. That's the wife's name, Herodias. Even the sound of it. Gives you an indication what's coming, right? Herodias. His brother Philip's wife, for he had married her. Because John had said to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Can you just imagine John in his camel's hair and his Nazarite hair going into the palace and saying to Herod, it's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. You have to love John. Therefore, Herodias held it against him. Oh, we women hold grudges. And she wanted to kill him, but she could not. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a just and holy man, and he protected him. And when he heard him, he did many things and heard him gladly. Now, isn't it interesting that Herod listened to John. He knew he was a godly man, but still Herod never received the truth that John was preaching. How sad is that? So close, so close, right there, but yet so far. Now, it was during this time in prison that John sent word to Jesus through his own disciples asking, are you the Messiah or do we look for another? And there's been a lot of discussion about what's happening with John, what was going on. But I want us to look at what Jesus said. And I think we can take a lot of what was happening with John from what Jesus said. Jesus responded to John's disciples in Matthew 11, verse 4. Go and tell John the things which you hear and you see. The blind are seeing, the lame are walking, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who is not offended because of me. Now in the natural, we can't help but sympathize with John being stuck in prison. He's an outdoorsy man, used to the wilderness, and now he's confined to a prison cell. That couldn't have been fun. He wasn't out and about where he could see with his own eyes the continuing miracles of Jesus and hearing the ministry of Jesus. Maybe he was only getting bits and pieces in prison. He just couldn't see at that time the whole picture. Whatever was going on in John's mind 
about the validity of Jesus being Messiah, we, we don't know. We just know he's asking. And Jesus responded with Old Testament prophecies that John would have known of what the Messiah would bring. These were actually taken from Isaiah 29. It's almost the same words that Jesus says to the disciples to go tell John. Remind him of those words. that he, John would have known those words, would have studied them. And then to let him know it's coming true. It's happening. And I think when John's disciples went back to prison, to the prison, and reported the words of Jesus, I think it was enough for John. He was good. He was good. He was convinced. He was good. It's all he needed. Because Jesus later said in Matthew eleven seven, 7, John was not a reed easily shaken by the wind. Jesus knew John's heart. And I think the words of Jesus just simply kind of stirred up John's faith a little bit. And at that moment, I believe John knew that he just knew it. His ministry was complete. He had prepared the way Messiah had come. John's time now to completely decrease had come. Now, the scripture doesn't tell us this, and maybe I have too much of an imagination, but I can't help but think that John spent the rest of that time in that prison cell praying for the ministry of Jesus, praying for souls to receive him, praying for the miracles to continue, praying for his ministry, and then praising the Lord for the opportunity that he got to be a part of this, even if it was just a small part. God had chosen him. God had used him. He got to be a part of that. He he was there. Now, we know how John's life ended. It wasn't pleasant from an earthly perspective. So if we go back to Mark chapter 6 and verse 21, Then an opportune day came. And you know, that word right there, that description, it lets you know Herodias was waiting in the wings, biting at the bits, waiting for that opportune day. And the day came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a feast for his nobles, the high officers, and the chief men of Galilee. And when Herodias' daughter herself came in and danced and pleased Herod and those who sat with him, and can I just say, I don't think this was ballroom dancing. (laughs) Maybe that's all I need to say. The king said to the girl, ask me whatever you want and I will give it to you. He also swore to her, whatever you ask me, I will give you up to the half of my kingdom. And so she went out and she said to her mother, what shall I ask? And what does Herodias say? The head of John the Baptist. If there was the Worst Mother of the Year award, I think Herodias would be it. What kind of answer was that? Mm. So immediately, there we go again, immediately she came in with haste to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. Can you imagine And the Bible describes the king. He was exceedingly sorry. I don't think he was expecting that. I don't think he realized how manipulative women can be when their heart is not in the right place. Can we all say amen to that? Had no idea such conniving can go on. The king was exceedingly sorry Yet because of the oaths and because of those who sat with him, they had all heard him say. He swore it up to the half of the kingdom. He did not want to refuse her. Immediately, 
The king set a, sent an executioner and commanded his head to be brought. And he went and beheaded him in prison and brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl. And the girl gave it to her mother. The girl carried it down the hall to her mother. When John's disciples heard of it, they came and took away his corpse and laid it in a tomb. And if we keep reading this passage, you'll see where John's disciples came to Jesus after all of this. And that's just a great exhortation for us. When your heart is overwhelmed, go to the rock. (laughs) Take your troubles to Jesus. Tell it to Jesus. I can't imagine what those disciples must have been feeling. But they went to Jesus. And Jesus, so sweetly, with great compassion, he tells them, Mark 6, 31, Come aside by yourselves to a deserted place and rest a while. You know, sometimes it's okay to just pull away, snuggle into Jesus, and let him heal you. It's okay. There are tragedies, there are horrific things that we experience, that we see, that happen, and we just simply have no other choice. There's no better place to go than go to Jesus. Jesus is the only one who can bring healing for the memories, healing for that pain, and give us the strength that we can go on and still keep doing our assignment. For John, I think John was okay with decreasing so that Jesus could increase. That's what made John the greatest. John had already surrendered to whatever God wanted to do with his life. And so when that executioner walked in that day, I think John was just completely okay. However, God wanted to write out the story of his life. He had abandoned himself completely for God to use him any way God would choose. Whether it was out in the desert, whether it was preaching a message of repentance, whether it was baptizing, or whether it was not compromising the truth, that eventually cost him his life. John was empty, empty of all self. He was totally sold out, fully committed to give his all for Jesus. That's what made him the greatest. But what's interesting with this whole discussion of John being the greatest is that Jesus goes on to say in that passage, Matthew 11, But he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he, is greater than John. Now that seems a little, okay, where are you going with that? John was considered the greatest, you just said it. But are you saying that someone without any of John's qualifications, without any of John's other great attributes, they could become greater than John? How's that going to happen? Especially regular people like me and you. (laughs) How, How does it happen? By having the same attitude that John had. By decreasing so that Jesus can increase. By being completely empty of self. We decrease, he increases. And we receive all of him. We truly abandon every part of our lives into his hands. We give him total control, total control of everything about us. We're willing to be used without anyone ever knowing our name, without anyone ever knowing that we were being used. Oh my goodness, completely empty of self and any recognition and in turn, We receive all of him. As we decrease, he will increase. 
the blessing of his presence, the blessing of his strength and his power flowing through us. There's a greater, deeper fellowship and communion that we have with him. I think when John went to be executed, that had to be the closest moments to God he had ever been because he was totally sold out and totally surrendered to Christ. Jim Elliott, the martyred missionary to Ecuador, said it so well. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. To gain what he cannot lose. When we surrender all to Christ, we gain treasures, abundant treasures, eternal treasures that are never lost. Yes, John the Baptist was great. Oh, but Jesus leaves it wide open for us to be just as great. All we have to do is decrease just like John so that he may increase. Let's pray this morning that the Lord will help us to decrease so that he can increase. Father, I thank you this morning for the words that you have shared with us today. I thank you for the story of John the Baptist, and we've seen so much of him as a man, his obedience to you, his boldness, his his strength, God, maybe his little uniqueness. But, oh, God, we've also seen his heart. Help us to be like John and that we decrease so you may increase in our lives. This is what you need in these chaotic times for your church, Lord. That we are filled more with you than ever before. That we are walking more in boldness and power than ever before. But God, there's got to be a decrease of self. A decrease of our own agenda of what we we want you to do or what we want to to say and be for you, our ideas. It's gotta it's gotta be surrendered to you, Lord. We want your total control in our lives. Help your ladies this morning, all of us, to surrender to you once again. Even all the desires of our heart, Lord, we commend them to you, we give them to you, we surrender them to you, Lord that you would have your way and your will, your perfect will, not just what we want. Cleanse us today. Strengthen us today. Open our eyes, Lord, to areas that need to be more surrendered and committed to you, Jesus. Oh, increase our love for you. Increase our faith to believe you, that you're able to work your work in us. Yes, Lord. You're able to give us a desire, Lord, to be more surrendered. By your Holy Spirit. Oh, these are sobering words to us today. But Holy Spirit, make them alive and make them real to us. And give us greater revelation of them this week. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for each lady who's here. Each lady watching. I just pray, Holy Spirit, you would move in her life. In Jesus' name. By your hand, your power. Thank you, Father. We give you praise. We give you praise. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you. And remember, uh, next week after the Bible study, we'll plan to go to Mia's table. So uh, you can mark that on your calendars. And I will send you the address. And again, if you did not get an email from me yesterday and you want to just send me an email I've got my my name address there on the scripture sheet and then that way I'll make sure you're on the list and you can get information about the Bible study here and that's where I'll put the address to the Mia's table all righty God bless you thank you for coming